We need to include salt in our diets. There's a lot of misinformation about salt. There really has been a concerted push to get Americans to reduce salt to way below their needs. Now, we absolutely need a teaspoon and a half of salt every day. From the Weston A. Price Foundation, welcome to the Wise Traditions podcast for wise traditions in food, farming, and the healing arts. We are your source for scientific knowledge and traditional wisdom to help you achieve optimal health. Hey, Hilda here. The word salty is often used to describe someone who is bitter, angry, or upset. But here at the Weston A. Price Foundation, we think being salty is a good thing. Well, it is when we're referring to unrefined, naturally mineralized salt in the diet. This is episode 270, and our guest today is Sally fallon Morell. Sally is the president and founder of the Weston A. Price Foundation. She is an advocate for a nutrient-dense diet, particularly one based on the wisdom of our ancestors. Today, Sally reviews principle number nine of the 11 principles of the Wise Traditions Diet. That is, that all traditional diets contain some salt. She explains how salt is critical for proper brain and body functionality. And honestly, this goes against the grain of most conventional advice, which promotes a low-sodium diet. But as we understand it, low-salt consumption has been linked to metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, poor digestion, parasites, and even depression. So listen up as Sally covers a wide range of salt-related topics today. The kinds of salts recommended to consume, salts' role in hormone function, brain development, and sleep. And she even addresses concerns about the plastic or microplastics in sea salt. Before we get into it, a quick word. Did you know that we have a health freedom track that we are releasing every Friday in the month of October and one in early November, I believe? The idea is to learn more about how we can advocate for our own health and medical freedoms. So check it out. Bonus episodes every Friday this month and in early November. And if you like what you hear, join hands with us. There is no time like the present to become a member of the Weston A. Price Foundation. Just go to westonaprice.org and click on the Join Now button. And membership only costs $30 per year if you sign up using the coupon code WAPF10 at checkout. Again, that's WAPF, all lowercase, 10, for the value of $10 off so you can become a member for only $30. I can't believe how good this is. So join us. And Ancestral Supplements, bovine tracheal cartilage with liver by Ancestral Supplements, putting back in what the modern world has left out. New Zealand sourced nose to tail organ meats and bone marrow in convenient gelatin capsules. Our family can't get enough of these supplements. I personally love the liver and all of it is based on the ancient wisdom of like supports like. Order yours today at ancestralsupplements.com. And this episode was from our archives. It originally aired in November 2017. Enjoy! This is Holistic Hilda, and you're listening to Wise Traditions. Welcome to Wise Traditions, Sally. Thank you, Hilda. It's great to be back. I guess we're doing principle number nine. That's right. We're going slowly but surely through the 11 principles of the Weston A. Price Foundation based on the findings of Dr. Price. So what's number nine about? Well, number nine is about salt, and we do need salt. We need to include salt in our diets. Well, that's not what the conventional (laughs) medicine people say. You know, like the subject of fats, like so many subjects out there, there's a lot of misinformation about salt. There really has been a concerted push to get Americans to reduce salt to way below their needs. Now, we absolutely need a teaspoon and a half of salt every day. And the idea is to get us down to three quarters of a teaspoon per day. And you're going to see a lot of very serious health consequences from that. Is it because there have been studies that have linked high sodium levels in our diet to heart disease and high blood pressure? Uh, Yes, that's the argument that's being used. The Uh, so-called DASH diet, which is for people with high blood pressure, is a very low-salt diet. But the studies show that salt reduction will help about 10% of people with high blood pressure. Another 10%, their blood pressure goes up when they reduce salt. And about 80% of the population, it doesn't have any effect on their blood pressure. So just like for heart disease and lowering cholesterol, that might be a strategy for 
one or two percent of the population, people with the extremely high cholesterol, but it's being applied to everybody. So same with the salt. Studies have shown that yes, a small portion of people with high blood pressure benefit from lowering their salt intake, but now it's being applied to everyone and not just people with high blood pressure, but everyone. They want this to be population wide. Across the board. Across the board, yes. And let's start with the fact that your body needs sodium. We need sodium. The basic reason we need sodium is to have osmotic pressure on the inside from, you know, a different pressure on the inside and the outside of the cell. Our bodies are supposed to be salty. And we need a teaspoon and a half of salt to give us the amount of sodium required to have that osmotic pressure. And we need that every day. Now, what people don't realize, and that's kind of a surprise, we eat a lot less salt than we used to. We have information showing that between the War of 1812 and the First World War, our salt consumption was about double. It was about three teaspoons a day. And that's because we were using salt to preserve our meat. So even though we do have a lot of you know, fast foods, chips, and things that are very salty today, we are not preserving our foods in salt. So we actually are eating less salt than we used to eat. That's fascinating, but it's not surprising because salt was used to cure meats, as you said, and so it was used traditionally all over the place. So people were consuming more salt, and yet they weren't struggling with high blood pressure, were they? Well, not we don't think so, and certainly not with heart disease and myocardial infarction like we have today. In the past, you could only have a culture, a civilization, where you had salt because you absolutely needed salt to preserve meats and to and, and that sort of thing. Now, there were some cultures that didn't have that much salt, and then they, they ate uh, plants and insects and things that were naturally salty, or they consumed the blood of their animals to get salt. The Eskimos, for example, blood was a very important part of their diet because it's salty. And the South Seas, they put salt water in their foods, the seawater, and they actually traded the people who were growing taro root in the interior of the islands would trade salt water for the taro roots so they could have salt. That is fascinating. And I know there are a lot of sayings like he's worth his weight in salt, yes. right? And and things like that that show how valuable salt was to these cultures. Yes, and it was also used as a way to control people. So the salt tax, uh, well, the Romans um, would withhold salt from people they wanted to destroy. And they had a salt tax in India. It was why there was the uprising in India that Gandhi led. It was because the British were basically denying salt to the people. So when you don't have enough salt, you develop some very, very serious health problems. And the other thing that salt is really important for is neurological development. We have two types of cells in our brains. Uh, The white cells and the gray cells. And I think the gray cells are the glial cells that help us make connections, that help us do creative thinking, to put two and two together, so to speak. When they studied Einstein's brain, he gave his brain to science. You see, he had lots and lots of glial cells. And you need salt to develop your glial cells in your brain. So to have a civilization, to have enough people who can run your civilization, you just definitely need a lot of salt. And we kind of naturally crave salt, don't we? We do. We have a salty taste in our mouth. It's not there to torture us. It's there because we need to put salt on our food. We, we need quite a bit of salt, much more of the sodium than we do of any other minerals. We also need the chloride in salt. So uh, the chloride is in salt. Salt is sodium chloride. The body uses um, chloride to make hydrochloric acid, and that's what we need for digesting meat. And a lot of people say, oh, I can't digest meat. It's probably because they're on low-salt diets. Uh, The other thing I've had uh, doctors tell me, which is very interesting, is people who go on low-salt diets are much more prone to getting parasites because they don't have the hydrochloric acid in their stomach, which is a very strong acid. There's a pH of about 2. That's your first defense against parasites. So, uh, yeah, salt is, is very important. Now, the quality of the salt matters too, though. When you say we should make sure that we get sufficient salt in our diets, you're not talking about table salt, regular table salt that you'd buy at the store, right? Well, table salt is better than nothing. And one of the things I like to point out is that in the sense that we have adequate salt, everybody has salt today. It's 
It's not taxed. It's not expensive. It's very plentiful. That is one of the advantages of the civilized diet that traditional cultures didn't necessarily have. They really had to make sure that they got salt, and sometimes they didn't get salt. And as a modern people, we always have access to salt, and that that's a great advantage. But yes, we do recommend unrefined salt because what happens in salt manufacture, they take the evaporated seawater, which is full of trace minerals, got a lot of magnesium in it, for example, it's about 10% magnesium, and then they refine it. So it goes through a very heated refining process that removes all the trace minerals, removes the magnesium, so all you have left is sodium chloride, and then they add an aluminum compound to make the salt pour when it rains. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I remember going to my grandmother's. She had little salt bowls. Remember? Do you remember those on the yeah. table? Yes, because in the old days, the salt wouldn't come out of the salt shaker, oh. or you added grains of rice to the sh- salt shaker. But once they Morton started to refine the salt, then it would pour when it rains. Now, isn't aluminum bad for us? Yes. So there's an aluminum compound in the regular salt, and that's a very good reason to avoid refined salt and to avoid processed foods because, you know, that's going to be used in processed foods. So Tom Cowan, uh, Dr. Tom on our board, says that his number one treatment for high blood pressure is to tell people to just use unrefined salt. And it almost always works. Uh, Their blood pressure comes down. And of course, it's a way of getting them off of processed food also. (laughs) So we want the salt. Okay, we can have the table salt. But we really want salt that has these trace minerals you're describing. That's like a Himalayan salt, sea salt. Talk to us a little bit about those differences as, as best you can. Okay, so there are lots and lots of brands of unrefined salt. And the shopping guide put out by the Weston A. Price Foundation lists all these brands. And they basically fall into two categories. One is evaporated seawater, and the other is mined salt. So that would be salt from Poland or salt from the Himalayas and or salt from Utah. There's mined salt from Utah. And these are all good sources of salt. I like to say your salt should be gray, pink, or beige, and not white, because if it's white... It's been refined. Good point. Good point. So let's go back to the high blood pressure topic. You said that salt, at least as some prescribe it, can actually be helpful to lower it and get it down to a normal rate. Can you talk to us a little bit more about that? Yes. One of the things that happens if you don't eat enough salt is that you're, you get metabolic syndrome, and that's characterized by high blood pressure. The other thing that happens is insulin resistance. And there was a very dramatic study where they put a number of volunteers on a no-salt diet and did certain tests every day. And within one week, every single one of these volunteers had developed insulin resistance. So now you're talking about diabetes, metabolic syndrome, all sorts of problems uh, from not having enough salt. But I feel like everything's labeled low sodium, low sodium. Should we be glad about that or not, Sally? Yeah, no, that's not a good idea. You absolutely need sodium. Another thing that the studies have shown is that high salt consumption is associated with longevity. So people who get plenty of salt, who satisfy their body's requirements for sodium and chloride by eating salt, they live longer. Uh, And I have discovered something very interesting that... Um, if I take a pinch of salt before I go to bed at night, I fall right to sleep. It's the best treatment for insomnia that I know of. And that tells me that salt is somehow involved with the adrenal glands, you know, just um, helping the adrenal glands to relax. We know that people who are under a lot of stress need salt, uh, need more salt. Uh, There's certain conditions where they need you know, very large amounts of salt. I think President Kennedy had one of those, I think it was Addison's disease. And he just, those people are using up salt at a great rate because the adrenal glands need salt. And so they need to eat a lot of salt. Well, it's interesting that taking that pinch of salt before going to bed, it just, you just zonk out, you know, (laughs) your, your adrenal glands, uh, relax. Now, this sounds fantastic. What about children? How much salt should they take in? Children absolutely need salt during the period of growth. Of course, they need salt for digestion, but they also need salt for neurological development. There was a very interesting legal case. uh, It was called the neo Mulsey formula case. Mary Ennig was actually an expert witness in this case, where they thought, we're going to make this infant formula better, and we're going to leave out the sodium. 
which they did, and the babies uh, became mentally retarded, and there was a big payout in the case, and the um, uh, the company went out of business. So the formula makers know very well they have to add sodium to the the infant formula. So yes, children definitely need uh, sodium for growth, but for neurological development as well. And salt also has the benefit of making things taste better, doesn't it? Yeah, that's right. Now, what happens if we go to everything's going to be low in salt, we're going to keep the salt out of the food? Well, the industry has... They have these uh, salt substitutes that stimulate the salt the salt taste buds in your tongue and make you think you're eating salt. So you're going to eat these foods, and they taste okay, right? But the body is going to be saying to you, wait... I didn't, I didn't get salt here, so you need to eat more and more and more. And I think what you'll see is a, a huge increase in obesity if they, they do as planned, which is there's this uh, substance called Simonix, and it's needed in such small amounts that they don't have to get approval from the FDA to use it, and they don't have to label it. So if you see something that says low sodium, I would just run as fast as you can away from this food because it's probably got this terrible additive in it and your body is not going to be tricked. It's going to say, wait, I need to eat more of this because I'm not getting the sodium I need. Oh yeah, that's that's a theory I have a lot of times too, that um, our body is still searching for the nutrient that's missing. When you eat something that's like low fat, of course we know we need fat, but your body's thinking, okay, I want this, but where's the fat? Yeah, right. And so you keep eating it. And that's one reason people eat kind of compulsively sometimes. Yes. I think. Yes. I like to tell a story about people who avoid fat all day long and don't eat butter. And by uh, nine o'clock at night, they're absolutely starving for fat. And they go to the freezer and they eat a half a gallon of ice cream standing there right there with the freezer door still open. They, they can't stop from eating this ice cream uh, to get the fats they need. And it's the same thing with salt. Uh, so again, why not just Eat your salt on, with your meals, do your lovely unrefined salt, and then you won't, can't make promises, but you be much, much less likely to crave a bag of chips in the afternoon. Oh, that sounds fantastic. Now, my question is, won't all this salt make us especially thirsty? <laughs> <laughs> well, not necessarily. I mean, I add a pinch of salt to the water I drink because that puts minerals in the water. You know, that's a good question. And I'm not sure I know the answer, but certainly the average amount of salt that people should be eating, a teaspoon and a half a day, and that's throughout the day on your food, that's not necessarily going to be making people more thirsty. Coming up, the fascinating results of a study in England conducted in the 1930s. It shows what happens when salt is completely removed from the diet. You're listening to the Wise Traditions Podcast from the Weston A. Price Foundation. We pause now to recognize our sponsors. Listen to the end. Did you know that at the end of every podcast episode, we read a letter from a recent journal or a review from Apple Podcasts? So listen to the end of every podcast for a little something special. And we want to invite you to go deeper with us. Join hands with our work of research, education, and activism for the Weston A. Price Foundation. Become a member for only $30 if you use the coupon code WAPF10 at checkout. Just go to westonaprice.org and click on the Join Now button and use the code WAPF10 so you can join us at a bargain price. And now is the time to do so because you can be a part of members-only perks that we have available. You can be a part of the Facebook group and private conversations that we call Wise Conversations with Sally fallon Morell and other friends of the foundation. Again, these are yours for becoming a member, not to mention the quarterly journal that you'll receive four times a year. I'm telling you, there's lots of good that comes from joining hands with us. And thanks in advance. And Ancestral Supplements with bovine tracheal cartilage with liver. Ancestral Supplements offers New Zealand-sourced nose-to-tail organ meats, bone marrow, and bovine tracheal cartilage in simple, convenient gelatin capsules. The life's work of Dr. John F. Pruden showed that bovine tracheal cartilage had unique and powerful effects on wound healing, immune conditions, joint health, and other conditions considered to be treatment-resistant to conventional therapies. All of these conditions were immune in nature with the exception of the wound healing studies. According to Dr. Pruden, bovine cartilage closely resembles fetal mesenchyme, the primordial tissue which muscle, bone, tendons, ligaments, skin, fat, and bone marrow, the heart of the immune system, all develop. Bovine tracheal cartilage provided concentrated amounts of connective tissue, immunoregulators, and cartilage building blocks that are now missing from the modern diet. So visit ancestralsupplements.com to see what they can do for you. Ancestral supplements, putting back in what the modern world has left out. 
This is Holistic Hilda, and you're listening to Wise Traditions. Can you talk a little bit more about studies and what they've found? Because I know people like to hear the science behind yes, all of yes. this. One very interesting study took place way back in 1936 in England, and they put three human beings on a completely salt-free diet combined with sweating, so it was to quickly reduce the amount of salt in the diet. They immediately lost weight and began to look ill. Uh, their sense of taste and smell was affected. The foods became tasteless, and fatty foods made them nauseous. Now, this is very interesting because people tell me, I can't eat fats because they make me nauseous. It might be because they're not getting enough salt in their diet. And interestingly enough, they drank lots of water. They couldn't get enough water. They got no relief from the sensation of thirst. Two of the three were troubled with nightmares. Now there, once again, there's the salt being able to help you to sleep. Uh, They suffered from frequent cramps. They became apathetic and had difficulty speaking. And their mental capacity was dulled. All returned to normal health and vigor once they started eating salt again. And who conducted that study? This was a a really seminal study. His name was McCants, and this was in England. The, uh, a study with rats, uh, researchers found that rats on salt-deprived diets shied away from activities they normally enjoyed, so it's a sign of depression. And they co- concluded that salt is a natural mood buster. Mary Ennig told me a wonderful story years ago. Apparently, uh, in the up to the year 500, Uh, AD, there was a a very vigorous salt trade all over Europe, and the salt was evaporated from the Atlantic Ocean, and then it was traded all into the interior. And in 500 AD, the seas rose about 50 feet and covered all these salt pans over, and the salt trade was wiped out overnight. And what happened was, and and that's when the Dark Ages started. It stopped the trade, but also people just didn't have enough salt to be intelligent. And it was only when they got those, that salt going again, which wasn't till about the year 1000, that they kind of came out of this, these Dark Ages. Wow, that is fascinating. And a tribute to what you're saying, salt is essential for proper brain function. Now, I do want to tell you, I saw some people asking a question recently on one of our social media platforms. They were saying, that they were a little bit afraid of sea salt because our oceans are so polluted. What would you, what would you say to them? We, we've learned this recently that they found really tiny particles of plastic in the sea salt. I wouldn't panic. Uh, they also said that if you were eating a normal amount of sea salt, you'd probably get six of these particles per day. <laughs> and you, you don't digest these particles. I mean, they're excreted. So I, I don't think this is the biggest threat out there. And what I would like to do is test all different varieties of salt for uh, these kind of impurities. But I'm still using sea salt. Well, that's one thing I like about the foundation is that research is one branch of its work. So hopefully we'll get that salt study done and be able to tell people what they should do. But you're not alarmed. No, I'm not alarmed by this. I also think that on our good diet, you can really handle a lot, and we definitely live in a toxic world. I'd be more concerned about the aluminum in processed salt than particles of plastic in sea salt. I wonder if some people are afraid of eating too much salt because doesn't salt make you retain water so they're afraid they're going to get bloated or something? What do you think of that, Sally? I think normal salt consumption, that wouldn't happen. If, if you are retaining water when you eat any salt, and there are, I know there are a few people like this, I would look to you know hormonal imbalance. And I would increase your consumption of fats and especially of vitamin A so that your body can make all these adrenal hormones that organize uh, your body and make sure that everything's working properly. So let's go back to um, other concerns people have and, and studies that have been done maybe pertaining to asthma or obesity. Yes, there was one theory that Salt inhibits bronchial function in the lungs and that it contributes to asthma. So they, you know, they did a big study on this and they found that that wasn't the case. There was no evidence that eating salt or eating too much salt contributed to asthma. Okay. Same thing with that obesity. Again, yes, if you're eating a lot of uh, junk food, yes, you're going to gain weight, but I don't think it's necessarily the salt that's making you gain weight. And as Again, if you're restricting salt, you're going to just eat and eat to get the salt you need. It's always about nutrient density, Hilda. The, the more dense the vitamins and minerals are in our food, the less we have to eat to actually feed the body and to satisfy all our nutritional requirements. 
That is so true. I, this morning I didn't have time for breakfast and I know intermittent fasting is sometimes recommended by the foundation. And I was like, wow, I taught an exercise class and I felt fine. In the past, I would have been feeling my blood sugar dip and I, you know, I wouldn't have been able to handle it. So this is not salt related. <laughs> but I just wanted to say you're so right. It's all about nutrient density. You know, talking about nutrient density, there was an article in the Washington Post, actually a whole section devoted to agriculture, what's happening in agriculture. And there were interviews with various agriculture cultural people talking about the future. Well, one of the future are these is this new type of genetic engineering called CRISPR and it's, you know all kinds of praise for this uh, new type of way we're going to manipulate the plants and then the other article was about having these computers on their tractors so they could figure out just exactly how much fertilizer to drip on each part of the <laughs> field. There wasn't and it's all about growing a lot of food for export. That's all they're thinking about. Export, export, export. Nobody in our Department of Agriculture is thinking about food as something that nourishes us. And not a single taxpayer dollar is being spent on figuring out how to grow food that's full of nutrients. There's just no comprehension of this. And the, the salt fits right in here. Nobody's thinking, how can we make our salt as nutrient-dense as possible? Where are the most nutrient-dense salts? Where are the salts with the most trace minerals in them? Nobody's doing that kind of research. That is such a shame. It's so disappointing, but not surprising because we're about quantity, not quality of food, right? That's why they're looking at how can we get the biggest yield and the most animals in this one square foot, right? Right. And how can we get people to eat the most food? I mean, they talk about obesity and everything, but really the food pyramid and all of this low fat, low salt, it's a way of getting people to eat and eat and eat to buy lots of food. And that's the purpose of the Department of Agriculture. It's not to create nourishing food. It's to create a product for export or a product to be manipulated into junk food that's cheap and makes a lot of money for a few people. That's really disappointing, but it seems like the bottom line is not our health, but the dollar, right? The dollar. And no one's going to change this for you. We're not going to change the mindset of the Department of Agriculture. I like to say that our food is regulated by people who use non-dairy creamer. You're not going to change them. <laughs> and our government, uh, you know, um, our current president drinks diet sodas. I mean, it's not going to change from the top, and it never will. It only is going to change one person at a time, you know, waking up, getting the picture, and choosing to eat nutrient-dense food. and getting their food from farmers who are producing nutrient-dense food. So I like to say this is nature's way of dealing with this problem. It's the natural selection of the wise. And people who continue to eat junk food, food that's depleted, eventually they will die out. And it sounds really cruel, but they just won't have children. Mm -hmm. And the people, I like to call them the furry little mammals who are coming along, <laughs> who are eating nutrient-dense food, making wise choices, they'll have healthy children. And, and I like to say these healthy children will solve all these problems for us. <laughs> I certainly hope so. Well, we're going to wrap it up now. I want to ask you the question I often ask. If the listener could only do one thing to improve their health, maybe related to salt in this case, what would you recommend that they do? Yes, well, based on our discussion today, I would say don't, you don't have to cut back on salt, but only use unrefined salt in your cooking, put on your food. That's fine. Don't ever feel guilty about that, but just make the choice for unrefined salt, and that will have the very happy consequence of not eating junk food because there's no refined, unrefined salt in junk food. That's excellent, Sally. Thanks for your time today. Thank you for having me. Our guest today was Sally Fallon Morell. Check out her blog at nourishingtraditions.com. And I'm Hilda Labrada gore You can find me at holistichilda.com. And for the show notes for this and every podcast episode, visit our website, westonaprice.org, and click on the podcast page. And now for a review from Apple Podcasts. Can't get enough from With Quiet Hands. As a young mom who is doing my best to raise healthy kids and to have a healthy lifestyle myself, I am continually inspired by the content on this podcast. Thanks for the quality information. You are so welcome, With Quiet Hands. We really appreciate your taking the time to do the review. 
And feel free to write a letter to the editor so we can include it in an upcoming journal or to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts yourself. Who knows, we might give you a shout out in an upcoming episode. And thank you so much for listening. Stay well, my friend. Hasta pronto. On behalf of the Weston A. Price Foundation, thanks for listening. We have many free resources to support you on your health journey. Visit WestonAPrice.org to find podcasts, articles, videos, and more. You can also find a local chapter near you for help in finding sources of great food. We invite you to support the Foundation's mission of education, research, and activism by becoming a member. Thanks again, and take care. Wise Traditions is a project of the Weston A. Price Foundation for wise traditions in food, farming, and the healing arts. The content on this podcast is provided for informational purposes only and is not intended to substitute for the advice provided by your doctor or other healthcare professional. It is not intended to be, nor does it constitute healthcare or medical advice.